as we have seen in the last couple of episodes, we have entered into a new phase of the Pacific War, one that was to be dominated by Allied offensives. The initiative won at Midway and ratified at Guadalcanal and New Guinea now allowed the Allies to launch their next offensives deeper into the heart of the Japanese Empire, with new objectives such as the important Lei Salamaua base, the island of New Georgia, and the strategic Gilbert Islands. Yet before these new offensives could be launched, the Allies had to prepare for these operations, and for that, they would need to meet and discuss their course of action. One of these key meetings would occur in March, bound to change the course of the Pacific War forever. So join us as we delve into another exciting episode of our series. Hey history fans, as you know, the YouTube algorithm precludes us from releasing more than 3 or 4 videos per week, as the more we release, the lower the average views are, which hurts the overall standing of the channel in search rankings and such. Still, we produce more videos than that, and we want to give our viewers a chance to watch them. Videos are now published as YouTube member and Patreon exclusives. For just $5 per month, yes, one cup of coffee, you'll get access to 25 new videos. Currently, we're running two battle series, the Peloponnesian Wars and the Italian Unification Wars. Click the link in the description or pinned comment, and you'll get exclusive videos, early access to all videos, learn our schedule, get access to our private Discord, watch our behind-the-scenes videos, and much more. Thank you for watching and your kind support. We wouldn't be able to do what we love without you. As we've previously examined on this series, planning for the Pacific theatre of operations was plagued by two main problems. The strategy of Europe first, which relegated the Pacific to the status of a secondary theatre, and the inter-service problems between the army and navy over the question of overall command. Since neither side was willing to accept the proposals of the other, the Americans would have to adopt compromise solutions, which satisfied no one completely. This resulted in makeshift operation-to-operation -operation arrangements that had to be re-examined constantly as conditions changed. With the end of the Guadalcanal campaign and the completion of the first phase of the July 2nd directive, the question of command resurfaced yet again. Back in January, Admiral King had even proposed to form an integrated command under Admiral Nimitz, which was to include the Southwest Pacific area of General MacArthur once the reduction of Rabaul had been carried out successfully. Yet General Marshall would deftly evade King's major premise, forcing the Admiral to turn to the conduct of current operations. Both men, however, agreed that the capture of Rabaul, with its key port, supply and staging facilities, was still top priority, so they decided to call a conference between the main three Pacific commanders as soon as possible to iron out the details about the coming offensive. In the meantime, the South Pacific area of Admiral Halsey would experience how troublesome it could be to cooperate with MacArthur even in the face of extreme danger, which further emphasized the need for overall command, or at least for closer coordination in the theatre. Additionally, King was dissatisfied by MacArthur's failure to provide any detailed plans about the second phase of operations. He felt that unless more definite information was provided, then the Joint Chiefs of Staff should call upon Nimitz and Halsey to furnish their plans for going ahead in the Solomons in alleged support of MacArthur. By mid-February, it was finally agreed that instead of a conference in the Pacific, the commanders would just send their representatives to Washington to present their plans. On March 12th, the Pacific Military Conference thus opened, as important representatives of the Southwest, South and Central Pacific areas met at Washington, determined to get additional means for their respective areas. Lasting until March 28th, the sessions would be conducted under the supervision of the Joint Staff Planners, headed by Rear Admiral Charles Cook and Major General Albert Wedemeyer. At the first meeting, MacArthur's representatives presented the Elkton Plan for the seizure of the New Britain, New Island, New Guinea area, which essentially covered phases 2 and 3 of the July 2nd Directive, and was based upon the concept of elbowing forward on the eastern and western approaches of Rabaul. MacArthur's ambitious plan was to first seize operating airfields on the Huon Peninsula and New Georgia, then to simultaneously move in and establish air bases on western New Britain and Bougainville, and finally to capture Kavieng, thus isolating Rabaul, which would be taken by amphibious assault. 
For his plan, MacArthur calculated that 12 and two-thirds divisions and 30 air groups would be required for his southwest Pacific area, while 10 divisions and 15 air groups were to be assigned to Halsey's south Pacific area. Furthermore, of his total of 22 and two-thirds divisions, 10 would have to be amphibiously trained. The strengths called for in the Elkton plan were much greater than those projected by the War Department, which estimated that there would be 8 divisions and 6 air groups in the South Pacific, and 9 capable divisions and 15 air groups in the Southwest Pacific by October 1st. Yet all members agreed that the forces required, as shown in the Elkton plan, were the minimum necessary, so it was decided to refer this problem to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to evaluate whether to augment the forces allocated to the Pacific, or to modify the current directives for Pacific operations. Both King and Marshall would present two alternatives, and although the Army believed that aircraft requirements in the Pacific were met, and that giving them more could void the Casablanca decisions and affect the planned combined bomber offensive against the Luftwaffe, the Joint Chiefs of Staff would finally approve the Navy plan to cancel one division allotted to the South Pacific in exchange for increased air allocations for the Elkton plan. With these increases, the conferees agreed that only the second phase of the July 2nd directive would be carried out, including offensives against Madang, the southern portion of Bougainville, Cape Gloucester, and the Kirowina and Woodlark Islands, but not Kavieng and Rabol. King and the Navy would also fight for the question of command, but they could only secure minor concessions, as the army clung firmly to the provisions of the July 2nd directive. Thus, MacArthur retained direction of the operations against Rabaul, while Halsey, working under general directives from MacArthur, would be in direct command of operations in the Solomons. Once the matter had been settled by March 21st, the representatives began to discuss how to carry out these plans. Halsey's staff officers proposed to assault Munda early in April, but MacArthur's representatives, who also outlined their own plans for sweeping the Japanese out of the Huon Gulf, asked that the Halsey offensive be timed accordingly for mid-May. In the end, the Joint Chiefs of Staff would determine that Halsey was to wait until MacArthur had an airbase in the Trobriands. With the conference at an end, the Joint Chiefs of Staff would finally issue this new directive on March 29th. In conclusion, the Pacific Military Conference had succeeded at bringing about an adjustment of demands vis-à-vis -vis supply for the Pacific. The theatre representatives therefore gained a small victory with the Navy's assistance, but the War Department had also been able to keep the increases within bounds and the operations within reality. Both groups could feel some measure of satisfaction over the outcome, as the projected operations in the Pacific, which later assumed the codename Cartwheel, were going to carry the United States through 1943. After the conference, Halsey would immediately fly to Nomea to pay a call upon his new boss in Brisbane. This personal meeting would kickstart a fruitful relationship between the two commanders, one that would be important for the future of the Pacific War. As a side note, Admiral King would also institute the new numbered fleet system on March 15th, renaming Halsey's South Pacific Force to Third Fleet and MacArthur's naval forces to Seventh Fleet under the command of Vice Admiral Arthur Carpenter. Additionally, Allied air units in the Solomon Islands would be combined into a joint command, the Air Souls, led by Rear Admiral Charles Mason, which was subordinated to Halsey's South Pacific area. Meanwhile, the Japanese were also making a shift in their strategic plans. Admiral Yamamoto, after trying unsuccessfully to win a decisive naval action against the US at Midway, the Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz, had decided to wait for Nimitz to overextend and give him a big break. But the loss of six carriers and many destroyers in less than a year required conservation of these two vessel types, so Yamamoto would safeguard his carriers beyond the range of American aircraft and would only grant a small ration of destroyers to the exhausted 8th Fleet of Admiral Mikawa, who was by now seen as one of the main culprits for the loss of most of the Solomons. The disastrous Battle of the Bismarck Sea also served as a decisive reason for a vital revision of the Joint Army-Navy operational policy, whereby first priority was definitely shifted from the Solomons area to New Guinea. There, Generals Imamura and Adachi continued to bring the last elements of the 20th and 41st Divisions to the Madang-Wewak area, though after March, 
Allied air attacks on Japanese ships unloading or at anchor, especially night bombing raids, would increasingly interfere with transport operations. With the bulk of these forces already landed by the end of February, however, the 20th Division of Lt. Gen. Aoki Shigemasa was ordered to move towards Lei, constructing a supply road via the Finister Range, the Ramu and the Markham River Valleys. On March 25th, Imperial General Headquarters would finally issue a directive, mainly aiming to reinforce and secure the key Lei Salamawa area. Furthermore, this directive would place the IJA and its Air Force in command of the defense of New Guinea while the IJN and its aircraft was to take over the defense of the Solomons and Bismarcks. Moving back to the CBI theater, new and important developments were unfolding during the first Arakan campaign. As we last saw, the British offensive had been met with staunch resistance by the Japanese defenders, who managed to hold their ground at Rathodong and Donbaik, despite the enemy's numerical superiority. Yet again, the British military command, and General Irwin in particular, had made a number of blunders, such as launching set-piece frontal attacks in restricted areas, using armoured vehicles in penny packets, or firing insufficient weight of artillery shells to damage the enemy defences. These blunders would cost the British the initiative in the campaign, and would allow General Koga's forces to prepare for a counter-offensive. As the fighting in Arakan bogged down into stalemate by early February, and the military efficiency of the 14th Indian Division was questioned, General Lloyd had been reinforced with the fresh but woefully deficient in jungle fighting 71st Indian Brigade, and with the well-trained British 6th Brigade, though it had only gotten some rudimentary instruction for jungle combat. The 55th Indian Brigade had suffered enormous losses during an attack against Don Bike on February 18th, and so it would be relieved by these two fresh units. Yet, large numbers of Japanese were also being redeployed to the area from central Burma for an attack from east of the Mayu River. Threatened by this new menace and the approaching monsoon season, Lloyd informed Irwin that he was assuming the defensive. Yet, Marshal Wavell and General Irwin rapidly overruled this, as the Indians desperately needed a victory to shake off their belief of Japanese superiority. While Irwin personally prepared to lead this new assault, General Koga had finally brought the bulk of his 55th Division to Akyab, so his counter-offensive was about to begin. As we have previously covered, the 213th Regiment attacked the Caladan Valley on March 7th, successfully driving off the covering detachment of the V-Force. The 112th Regiment then applied heavy pressure on the Indian defenders north of Rathodong, who had no other choice but to pull back to Zedidong, leaving the 47th Indian Brigade trapped at the Huitza Bridgehead. Furthermore, Japanese units would also carry out an effective combination of deep and wide outflanking maneuvers and infiltration tactics against the British line of communications. Although the 71st Brigade would be sent to extricate these forces a week later, Irwin would decide to carry out his last assault against Don Bike anyways, which had also been reinforced by some of Koga's men. On March 18th, the 6th Brigade of Brigadier Ronald Cavendish therefore launched a deliberate frontal attack on a narrow front, despite advice from other commanders to outflank the positions along the mountain crest. As the set-piece attack made little progress and only got to penetrate a small distance, the British would once again suffer heavy casualties from the Japanese counterattacks and supporting artillery fire. Meanwhile, the 213th Regiment had secured the eastern side of the Mayu River against the increasingly demoralized Indian troops, and the 112th Regiment was preparing to cross the river. After the last failure, Irwin and Wavell had no other choice but to prepare to hold their ground, so this was to be Irwin's last attack against Don Bike. Wavell expressed great disappointment at the lack of imagination and tactics of his subordinates, believing that any plan that wasn't a blunt frontal assault could have been successful. On the night of March 24th, the Japanese would finally cross the Mayu River, and using narrow paths through the jungle, they advanced over the crest of the supposedly impassable Mayu Range. The following day, they set forth to cut the 47th Brigade's line of communications to Kyok Pandu, capturing the mountain crest near Atet Nanra on March 29th. In response, General Lloyd immediately ordered the 47th and 6th Brigades to retreat west of the mountains to avoid entrapment, 
thus acting contrary to his instructions to hold his position until the monsoon season broke. Yet Erwin would quickly countermand his order, sacking him of his position and assuming direct command of the 14th Indian Division. He also ordered elements of the 26th Indian Division, led by Major General Cyril Lomax, to bolster the British presence on the peninsula. Furthermore, Lomax was to assume command of all Arakan forces upon reaching the area. But in the meantime, Irwin would continue to run the show. Just as Lloyd had foreseen, however, disaster finally struck as the 112th Regiment managed to build a roadblock north of Indian Village on April 3rd, successfully cutting the lines of communication of the 6th and 47th Brigades. Cavendish then attempted to clear it at once, yet his efforts would be in vain and soon, Japanese soldiers would start to infiltrate the British positions at Indian Village on the night of April 5th, successfully overrunning the headquarters of the 6th Brigade and capturing Cavendish in the process. One of Cavendish's last acts before being overrun was to order the British guns to open fire on Indian, something that caused many casualties on the unsuspecting Japanese and ended up killing Cavendish himself. Upon assuming command of the Arakan forces, General Lomax immediately realized the seriousness of the situation and ordered a retreat from Indin. During the ensuing confused fighting, the 6th Brigade would narrowly escape destruction by retreating along the beach road, and the 47th Brigade would similarly avoid capture by destroying its heavy equipment and then escaping in small parties cross-country to the beach, and along it to reach British lines, thus ceasing to exist as a fighting force. Following this catastrophe, Lomax would skillfully regroup his rear brigades to defend the Mongdor Buthodong Road, and would further reorganize his shattered forward troops as they escaped northwards. Yet this was far from the end, as General Koga had no intention to stop there. He wanted to exploit this great opportunity and take the fight all the way to India. Finally realizing the worrying situation his troops were in, Wavell decided to appoint General Slim to lead the Arakan forces with Lomax as they prepared to face the brunt of the Japanese assault. But this is it for this week. Next episode, we'll take a look at some new and very important developments on the Solomons and New Guinea, as the Japanese prepared to launch a huge aerial counter-offensive, Operation Ego. If you want to watch this episode and more, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.